Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. Mike Riddle rose to captain in the United States Marine Corps before God began using his military-like presentation skills to teach the Bible. There's nothing like a Marine getting in your face. In this presentation, Mike makes those who believe in evolution look like fools simply by showing that all scientists believe DNA is a design. And if you have a design, you must have a designer. Enjoy How DNA Destroys Evolution by Mike Riddle. Hoorah, Mike. Well, isn't it a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian? Yeah. Not because it's getting easier, but because it's getting harder and the harvest is ripe out there today. Well, today's talk is going to be how DNA destroys evolution. We're going to talk about DNA and something inside DNA called information. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you can defend what you believe. If you don't believe in the Bible, then you don't believe in reality because I'm going to show you that today. I'm going to show you the only way to believe in reality is to understand and believe God's Word. So let's start with DNA. Now, I want to warn you, do not blink. <coughs> this talk is going to build and build and build until we get to what I call seven very exciting conclusions. And if you blink, you will miss something. So hold your eyes open here. So is DNA important? Well, let's look at it. Here's a quote. The genetic information system is the software of life. In other words, if you don't have DNA, you're not alive. So it is very important. It is essential for all living systems, DNA. So right there, we start off the importance of DNA. Now, our session goals. We're going to have two goals during this session. Number one, to logically and scientifically refute the worldview of materialism, which includes atheism, evolution, and secular humanism. We're going to do all that in 50 minutes. And then secondly, to establish at the highest level of scientific certainty the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing creator. We're going to do that using his creation and his word. And the theme will be Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1, 19 and 20, paraphrasing, says that nobody that's ever existed on this planet has an excuse for not believing in a creator. No one that has ever existed or whoever ever will exist has an excuse for not believing in the Creator. That is God's Word. <laughs> so we'll start with two opposing worldviews. One is God's Word, one is man's wisdom. God's Word says God created the universe. Man's wisdom says the universe created God. That puts it very bluntly right there. Now, materialism. The universe and everything in it is the product of natural processes. That is what materialism believes, that everything that exists is nothing more than mass and energy. There are no supernatural beings, no God, no angels. All, all that exists is mass and energy. That is materialism. Materialism is the foundation for many other philosophies, such as secular humanism, evolution, and atheism. That is the foundation for all of these. And we need to understand that going to foundations, going to presuppositions is the best way to argue with the non-believer is we have to get down to the core, why they believe what they believe. Now, David Noble, president of Summit Ministries, puts this very clear when he says, in fact, secular humanism, materialism, is the dominant worldview in our secular colleges and universities. It has also made gains in many Christian colleges and universities. Humanists recognize the classroom as a powerful context for indoctrination. Folks, one of the things we're trying to do in Answers in Genesis, we're putting a new program together, take back our Christian colleges, our Christian schools, and our Christian seminaries, take them back from secular humanism thought. <laughs> and you'll see how we're going to do some of that here. Because our biblical worldview is being replaced. What is it being replaced with? Something called evolution. Folks, there's too many churches today teaching evolution. February 20th, this year, for the third year in a row, 10,000 church leaders and pastors will get together to honor someone who lived, died, and stayed dead called Charles Darwin. Isn't that pathetic? That is the state of the church in this country today, and we need to take those churches back. And that's what we're going to start doing. We're going to start training teachers how to teach this subject, a biblical worldview, and train the next generation with a rock-solid foundation. It's being replaced. 
And as a result, many churches are in retreat today. They're doing whatever they can to change the word of God to be like the the world. Oh, maybe the flood was not a worldwide flood. Maybe God used evolution, folks. It's not a matter what God could have done. It's a matter what he did do. And he told us what he did do in the Bible. He did not use evolution. You see, right there we can tell people don't have a biblical worldview when they say, oh, God could have used evolution. That tells me they haven't read the Bible yet. See, the church is in retreat. Now, Madeline Murray O'Hare, one of those atheists, who was very instrumental in getting prayer out of the schools, very instrumental in making atheism very popular in this country, makes this statement. We atheists try to find some basis of rational thinking in which we can base our actions and our beliefs, and she says, we have it. And she continues, we accept the technical philosophy of materialism. It is a valid philosophy which cannot be discredited. Essentially, materialism's philosophy holds that nothing exists but natural phenomena. There are no supernatural forces, no supernatural entities such as gods or heavens or hells or life after death. That is the main teaching in our secular schools today. And can you imagine we send a lot of Christians there? So here's the challenge. Here is every one of our challenges. The challenge by materialists is that the church cannot defend itself against the philosophy of materialism. As materialists believe the church cannot prove or demonstrate the existence of God. And number two, they believe that if materialism is true, then evolution must also be true. There is our challenge. Folks, we can accept this challenge because today we're going to show the worldview of materialism can be shown to be inconsistent with reality. We're going to accept that challenge. We're not going to run away from it. We're not going to compromise. We'll take God's word without compromise, and we're going to take this challenge on. Are you ready? (laughs) Okay, let's examine evolution. Number one, we're told evolution is this upward progression. Upward progression from the very simplest to the more complex creatures. That is a wonderful story, but something gets left out of every one of our textbooks. It's called the most important ingredient of evolution. It's called information. Why don't they put that in the textbooks? You're going to see why when I get through this talk. See, all that change requires the addition of new functional genetic information. In other words, how does a land mammal become a whale? How does a dinosaur become a bird? It is called the addition of new functional genetic information. How does this happen? How could that happen? It's called the addition of new functional genetic information. So basically, the origin, nature, increase of information is an important and critical component of evolution. Why did it get left out then? It's the most important part of Darwinian evolution, but yet there's no mention of it in the textbooks. Something is not quite right here. So in other words, what we're going to use in this talk is DNA and information, the information in our DNA molecules, to show that materialism is false. We're going to take that challenge on. It's inconsistent with reality, and if that is true, then all those others must also be false. See, in other words, rather than going after the direct, we're going to go after the foundation, after their basic presupposition, and show that it's not consistent with reality, which destroys their whole foundation. And what happens when your foundations are destroyed? You have nothing to stand on, do you? That's what we're going to do. Now we've got about 45 minutes left. <laughs> Let's take a look at our two sources of knowledge. One is God's Word. And you know where it starts? Not in the book of Matthew, but the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. That is our foundation. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's all true. John 17, 17. Those are the two verses I use when somebody says, why do you believe the Bible? One, God wrote it, and secondly, he says it's true. Is that circular reasoning? It might be, but so is evolution. Evolution is true because evolution is true. That's what our students are being taught. Then God's supernatural creation, his natural revelation. Psalm 19.1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God, not evolution in long periods of time. And then Romans 1.19 and 20, which is one of the theme verses throughout this talk, what does it tell us? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, notice this, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as the eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, not one of us here has an excuse for not believing in a creator because he has shown it in his creation. And everybody that's not here today in the entire world 
does not have an excuse either. Let's include them too. No excuses. So now, information. Talking about information in the DNA. What is it? Where does it come from? And can it even be defined? Well, let's start here. You know where we really need to start? Is the definition of a definition. We gotta go all the way down to the basics to understand this thing. What makes a good scientific definition? You know why I do this? Because I read through a lot of textbooks and very few of the definitions are valid definitions. They've made them so fuzzy that our students don't even know what they're learning anymore. So we're gonna get back to the basics. If one, it needs to be precise, it has to have distinct borders, very, very clear, include all the attributes that are distinguished from its other entities and exclude everything that lacks at least one of these attributes. That is the definition of a definition in science. And I don't see that in a lot of textbooks. <coughs> Clear and precise. State exactly what is included and what is not included. Let's take an example here. Attributes. There's some fruits. Let's look at some attributes. Number one, it has to be firm, round, edible fruit. Does that leave anything out? Yes, it does. It leaves out bananas and pears. They might be edible, but they're not round, are they? Another attribute. Comes from a small tree. Does that leave anything out? How about the grapes? And then, red, green, or yellow edible skin with white flesh and a central core. That leaves out what? The orange. So when you look at all those attributes, they clearly define one and only one type of fruit, and that's the apple. You leave any one of those attributes out, then we don't have a very clear distinction of an apple, do we? That's what we mean by scientific definitions. Let's be very clear and state exactly the attributes that are included and not included. Let me show you some examples of bad definitions I'm finding in textbooks. Number one, evolution has changed over time. You know every one of you just evolved? Because every one of you just moved, breathed, and that's changed over time, isn't it? Is that a very clear definition of anything? No, it is not, but that's what our students are being taught, folks. That is an invalid definition because it includes every single thing in the universe. And here's another bad definition. Evolution, genetic change in a species over time. Well, I thought that was a good one. No, it is not. Because genetic change can be any kind of genetic change, and most genetic changes are what? The wrong way. Is that what evolution is? Because many genetic changes causes a loss of information. So that doesn't describe evolution either. Neither one of those are valid definitions for evolution. That's why our students are so confused. They're being deceived into believing evolution. You see, evolution requires the addition of new functional genetic information. And that is being left out of our textbooks. So what is information then? You know, we read dictionaries. We use it on the internet. We use it in our computers. We have it in our DNA. We have it in the Bible. But there's no universal definition. Isn't that something? There's not a single universal definition of information anywhere until today. I read a lot of these dictionaries. Not one dictionary I've read defines information. They describe it, but they don't define it. That's quite amazing. This is a pretty interesting word. In other words, a whole society thrives on information. Businesses thrive on information, but they can't define what it is. So what we need to do here is establish a definition of information that works in all cases. And we're going to call this a universal definition of information. And we need to see if it works in all biological systems and all technological systems, because there is no definition that currently works that way. That's what we're going to do. If it's going to be universal, it's got to work everywhere. So we're still building. Let me show you some of the current definitions of information. How about this one? Information is everything. <laughs> That's what I get from evolutionists. Does that definition exclude anything in the universe? No, it doesn't. It includes everything in the universe. That is not a valid definition. It's not valid. Here's the most popular definition of information used. It's called coded systems with or without meaning. That is the most popular. Let's look at that one. This model includes random assemblies of symbols that have no meaning. Well, let's take a look at that. There's a sentence. Hello, how are you? And there's the same number of letters down below, same letters exactly. And we are told by evolutionists the bottom line has more information than the top line. What? 
Is there a logical disconnect here? Have we just abandoned all logic? Well, let's suppose we do this. Some, let's suppose your computer's on the blink, and that happens once in a while. Your computer's on the blink, and you call up a computer engineer to come fix your computer, and what they do is they take your entire operating system and they scramble all the code and say, here it is, and then they charge you $500. Would you be happy with that? And then they walk away saying, you got more information now than you did before. <laughs> See, that's an example of code of systems with no meaning. Or how about they did this? You go to a hospital because you're not feeling well, and they say, oh, something's wrong with your DNA. Let me take all the molecules and DNA, all the information, and scramble it around. Would you walk out of that hospital? No, you wouldn't. You'd be dead. But see, that is the most popular definition of information today. Coded systems with or without meaning. That is not logical. It might work in very few cases where we have things called encryption, but that's the only place it will work. It does not work in any biological systems and does not work in most technological systems. So that is not a universal definition. It is only works in very specific cases. So let's look at the characteristics of information. Now, we're still building. <clears throat> I thought I saw someone blink out there. <clears throat> Don't blink. We're still building. Let's look what information is now. <clears throat> code. <clears throat> All information has a code. The English alphabet has a code. Hieroglyphics have a code. Computer. Co I put this last one in there for you computer people so I could see you salivating too. The word ASCII. <sighs> that just gets computer people excited when you say words like that. So all of those have codes. Now, a code is a rule for converting letters, words, phrases, or symbols into something meaningful. One reason for coding is to enable communication. So a code is very important to having information. That's one of the attributes or characteristics of information. Now, a second characteristic of information is something called meaning. Words have meaning, such as the word chair has meaning. Now, the word chair is not the physical thing, is it? But it represents something physical. Therefore, the word chair has meaning. That's what I mean by meaning. The word has meaning. The words space shuttle, the words space shuttle are not the physical thing, are they? But they represent the physical thing, so it has meaning. The word computer is not a physical thing, but it represents a physical thing. Therefore, it has meaning. The words Mike and Leslie Riddle are not the physical things, but they represent two physical people. That's what we mean by meaning. The words are not the real thing, but they represent the real thing. That's meaning. Meaning enables communication by associating words, phrases, or symbols to real objects. So we have code, and we have meaning, two characteristics of information. Now, what we are doing is building to a universal definition. Then we're going to apply that universal definition and come up with some very exciting conclusions. Remember our challenge now. What was our challenge? That we cannot defend against materialism. So I'm taking you on a little drive here now to the, to the conclusions. A third characteristic of information, expected action which is an implicit or explicit request or command for a given performance. Let me give you an example here. It's right before lunch, so you need this. Go to the grocery store and buy some chocolate chips. <laughs> now, what is the expected action? The expected action is that someone will go to the grocery store and buy some chocolate chips. Whether that is carried out or not is irrelevant, but there is an expected action in information. So we have a code, we have a meaning, and we have an expected action. And then the fourth characteristic is an intended purpose. An anticipated outcome or goal that is achieved by the performance of the expected actions. Let's take a look at that. Go to the grocery store and buy some chocolate chips. Now, the expected action was somebody would go and buy the chocolate chips, but the intended purpose is to make chocolate chip cookies. Doesn't that sound good before lunch? Do you see the difference between the expected action and the intended purpose now? So here are our four attributes we have discovered about information. A code, meaning, expected action, and intended purpose. Those are the four attributes, and we call that our information domain. 
Those four things. Remember when we got to a definition of a definition? We said you got to give very clear and precise, say what is included and what is not included. Well, here are the four things that are included with information. If any one of those is missing, then it's not going to be information based on the definition we're going to arrive at. So here's, here's how we arrived at all this. In July 2006, a team of scientists from around the world met to formulate what we call the universal definition of information. And it was based off of the work from Dr. Werner Gitt. And here was the team. We had a very diverse team. Very seldom will you ever see people from this cross disciplines coming together and agreeing on anything. But we achieved that. We spent a week, five days, enclosed in a room. And our purpose was to come up with this universal definition to see how powerful it would be against materialism. So we had engineers, astrophysicists, geneticists, physiologists, molecular geneticists, chem chemists, microbiologists. We had a PhD linguist to make sure we had the right wording, combustion theory, thermodynamics, mathematics, education, and computer science. That's a pretty diverse group for a whole week. And we liked each other. <laughs> you know, the amazing thing was, you know how we started every day? Reading from the Bible in prayer. We just thank God every day. I love running forums like this. So here was our <clears throat> four attributes. The goal was to develop a universal definition using those four attributes. And here's our definition we came up with. An encoded, symbolically represented message conveying expected action and intended purpose. That was the definition we came up with. What we did was we went and found the characteristics and then put them in a sentence. That's basically what we did. And we're going to have to evaluate this now. And then we're going to see the power of this definition. So there's the definition again. An encoded, symbolically represented message conveying expected action and intended purpose. Four attributes. What do we mean by encode? Simply a code, like the alphabet. Symbolic representation means it has meaning, like the word chair represents or means something real. Expected action means action, intended purpose meant purpose. So all we did was take the four attributes and put them into a sentence. Now we have to see, does this work anywhere? We have the definition, but does it really work everywhere? Let's take a look. We saw it work for the grocery store. Go to the grocery store and buy some chocolate chips that had a code, meaning, expected action, intended purpose. The code was the word. The meaning was store represents something physical, doesn't it? Expected action, somebody would go to the store and buy some chocolate chips. Intended purpose was somebody would go to the store, buy chocolate chips, and make cookies. Now let's take another sentence. How about in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth? Does that meet our definition? Well, how about code? It uses an alphabet, doesn't it? <clears throat> so it has a code. Does it have meaning? <clears throat> yes, it does. God represents something real. The heaven represents something real. Earth represents something real. So the words have meaning. Does it have an expected action? Yes, it's called creation. And then the intended purpose, which is implied there, is for the glory of God. His creation is for his own glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. So when we look at the Bible, we see what? It does meet our universal definition. So what we find in the Bible is what? Information. And that information came from where? God. He gave us his information. So now let's examine this definition scientifically. When we look at science, we have things called theories, models, hypotheses, and assumptions. Where do they come from? Well, we make them, don't we? We originate theories, hypotheses, and assumptions, and we formulate ideas about them. So we originate them, and we formulate ideas. But above that level of science, there's a very large gap, a large gap in science. Because what's above all of those theories, assumptions, and models is something called scientific laws. Now, look at the difference here. We discover scientific laws, and we formulate ideas. We don't create them. We can create hypotheses, we can create models and theories, but we do not create scientific laws. We discover them and formulate ideas. So where'd they come from? Starting to see a little mystery in here. We're building our way up there. Remember our two goals, refute materialism and show there has to be an all-knowing, all-powerful creator God. 
So what are scientific laws then if we don't invent them? Precise statements formulated by discoveries through observation and experiment. In other words, we discover them that have been repeatedly verified and never contradicted. Then it become, can become a scientific law. Let's look at some. We have scientific laws about matter. Newton's law of gravity. Laws of thermodynamics. Laws of electricity and many others. So we have many laws of science about matter. We have a law of science about life. That life only comes from life. The law of biogenesis. Which is... You know we have that law. Life only comes from life. Biogenesis. But every single biology textbook ignores that. Isn't that amazing? But we also have... Laws about information. So let's look at some of these. <clears throat> Why are scientific laws so important? Well, they're very important. See, without scientific laws, we might not have things like cars, computers, microwaves, and here's the most important, hair dryers. <clears throat> <laughs> Boy, we couldn't live without those, could we? <clears throat> and many other inventions. Without these laws of science, things wouldn't work the same all the, way, all the time, would they? It would all be like random chance events. Someday your car might work, someday it might not work. You might have cars like that already, but <clears throat> that's a whole nother talk. <clears throat> so scientific laws are very important for how we live. Now, I'm going to take a look at some of these scientific laws. I'm going to look at three general scientific laws. Then I want to show you two scientific laws about information. And we're still building our case. Like I said, don't blink. This case builds and builds. Scientific law number one, something material cannot create something non-material. Kind of makes sense when you look at it. Material things are mass and energy. Non-materials are things like thought and spirit. Something material cannot create something non-material. When was the last time any of you made an angel? Okay, we can't do that. Scientific law number two. Information is non-material fundamental entity and not a property of matter. What? There's something we don't normally see. Information is non-material. <clears throat> it's not a property of matter. <clears throat> in other words, we can take a look at the information in a book or in DNA, but we can take that information and put it in many different types of mediums, can't we? I can send the same information I write in a book by smoke signals. I can put it on a computer. I can put it in your, or your information in your DNA. We can record that in many other types of matter too, can't we? So information is not dependent upon the matter but it needs something material to reside. So that's scientific law number two. Let's take a look. A hard drive stores information, but the hard drive is not the information, is it? The information is encoded onto the hard drive. Likewise, a book stores words, but the book is not the information. And the paper is not the information. Information has been encoded onto this material resource. Let me give you a good example here. I take a balance scale here. And I take an empty CD, a modern CD, and I weigh it. Then I write the entire encyclopedia and the Bible onto that CD and weigh it again. And guess what? They weigh the same. In other words... Information has no mass. Now, I want to remind you of something. What was one of our challenges? That we cannot defend against materialism, which means all that exists is what? Mass and energy. Are you starting to see something very unique about information here? It has no mass. Because if something exists that is not material, that means the whole philosophy of materialism, which includes atheism, secular humanism, and evolution, are false. Now, our scientific law three, the first law of thermodynamics. We have to do this a little bit. You know why I have to bring physics into this? Because physics is fun. How many like physics? You know why you like physics? Because it's in the Bible. Romans 8, 20 through 22 is a general description of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, how many like physics? If you like the Bible, you like physics, okay? Because physics is fun. I like that. Now, mass and energy. First law, mass and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. All mass and energy in the universe is being conserved. The total sum is constant. Now, they might be able to change forms, but the total sum is constant. Let me show you something very exciting here about information. 
I can go to the whiteboard and create a brand new mathematical formula, which is information. Notice I said, create it. And then I can take an eraser and erase it. You know what I just did? Destroyed information. Now, wait a minute. I thought the first law of thermodynamics says you cannot create nor destroy mass or energy. But I can create and destroy information. Does that kind of give us a clue? Maybe information is not material? Is that important? Yes, it's going to be very important here. Hubert Yaki, PhD in physics and information theory, wrote a book called Information Theory, Evolution, The Origin of Life. Now, Hubert Yaki is an evolutionist, but look what he has to say. The genetic information system is the software of life, and like the symbols in a computer, it is purely symbolic and independent of its environment. Of course, the genetic message when expressed as a sequence of symbols is, what's that word? Non-material, but must be recorded in matter and energy. Right there, he's saying that something exists that is not material. And what is materialism? The ideology that all that exists is mass and energy. And if that can be shown to be false, then the whole world of secular humanism is also false. Now, I want to show you a possible contradiction, because some of you might be thinking about this. Possible contradiction. Something material cannot create something non-material. That was our scientific law one. Something material cannot create something non-material. Scientific law two says information is non-material. Therefore, how can humans, which are material, create information if it is non-material? Whoa, did we just contradict ourselves? Not to worry. God is good. <laughs> are we just a collection of chemicals as evolutionists teach? Because that's exactly what they're teaching in our schools today. They're teaching our first graders. They're just, chem just chemicals. Well, the wonder of being human, our brain and the mind. Eccles, PhD in neurophysiology and Robinson, PhD in psychology, write this. Eccles and Robinson discussed the research of three groups of scientists, all of whom produced startling and undeniable evidence that a mental intention preceded an actual neuronal firing. Some of you may not quite see that, but thereby establishing that the mind is not the same thing as the brain, but is a separate entity altogether. Ooh. Let's take it to the next one. This gets more exciting as we get along here. Norman Cousins, in interviewing John Eccles, Nobel Prize physiologist, says this. As I remarked earlier, this may present an insuperable difficulty for some scientists of materialist bent. But the fact remains and demonstrated by research that non-material mind acts on material brain. So we are not just chemicals. There's a non-material component to us, and it's demonstrated by research. Now, we've looked at the three general laws of science. Now let me introduce you to two laws of, about information. First law of information. Information cannot originate by random chance processes. Now, how does evolution work? Random chance processes. Does this sound good now? Information cannot arise by random chance processes. In other words, rolling the dice will never produce information. Wow, let's look at this further. Werner Gitt, PhD in physics and information specialist, says this. There is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. And what is the most key component of evolutionary process? Information. In order for one species or one kind to become a new kind, you must add new functional genetic information. How does evolution work? Random chance processes, but random chance processes never produce what? Information. Are you starting to see the power of information now? Something that's been neglected for many years. Second law of information. Information can only originate from an intelligent sender. Ooh, this is getting more exciting as we go along. <laughs> Corollary. That was one of those, what we call logical inference. 
Any given chain of information can be traced backward to an intelligent source. In other words, the information in this book, there's a lot of information in this book, but the book is not the source of information. We can trace it back to its originator. In this case, Dr. Werner Gitt. Okay, now, the teacher in me says it's time for a review. We've covered quite a bit, and we're getting closer to those conclusions. Number one, we were presented the challenge. The church was challenged that they cannot defend against materialism. Are you starting to see we've already broken some of that down? We established the good news that no one has an excuse for not believing in a creator. That's why we need to go out there and tell people about this, that there is a creator, and that creator died on the cross for us. We've established a universal definition of information. We have seen it works in technological systems, but does it work in living systems? We see it works with the laws of science, but now let's go to the last part. Does it really work in living systems? Because if it doesn't, it's not universal. DNA, let's go to our DNA. All living organisms contain a molecule called DNA. It's the fundamental part of life there. Does the DNA code found in DNA fit our universal definition? Well, let's start here. The decoded portion of information, DNA contains what? Four letters, A, T, C, and G. Letters, what do letters connotate? We might have a code. So let's look at the DNA code, those four letters. Words are comprised of three letters. We have four possible letters, but the words called codons are comprised of three letters. So it has a code. Does it have meaning? Well, each three-letter DNA word, a codon, represents one of the 20 different amino acids used in life. So it has meaning. Each word represents a physical amino acid. So, so far we have a code and we have meaning. Is there an expected action? The cellular proteins are essential for construction, function, maintenance, the reproduction in the entire organism. In other words, without those proteins, guess what happens? See, we get the amino acids, bring them in, and the amino acids build the proteins, get the proteins put together, and those are essential for life because they, they do a lot of work in there. And then is there a purpose? Yes, the purpose of all this, the DNA, is what? The existence of life. So when we look at all this, we can see that the DNA, the information encoded into our DNA, meets our universal definition. It has a code, it has meaning, has an expected action, and it has an intended purpose, which was, again, the existence of life. You know what happens if you take your DNA out of you? You're not producing any more what? Amino acids. You don't produce any amino acids, you don't get any proteins for doing any work. And then what happens? We're dead. Furthermore, ah, there's a furthermore here. The capacity and density of the information encoded in DNA surpasses anything mankind has accomplished. Let's examine that. John Sanford, PhD in genetics, Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. Wonderful book, wonderful book. It's called one of those semi-technical books. Don't worry about the name. It's only semi-technical. We bring a few with us. There is no information system designed by man that can even begin to compare to DNA. Hmm, if mankind can't do it, I wonder who did. Let me, let me show you how smart we are today. We're pretty smart today. Here's a 340 gigabyte hard drive. Does that mean anything to anybody? Some of you. Some of you, maybe not. 340 gigabyte. What we're saying there is we can take something about this size and put 340 billion pieces of information on it. Wow, we are smart. We're the only generation in all the history of mankind that's been able to do something like that. So we are definitely the smartest generation that's ever lived on this planet, according to us. <laughs> wow, that is smart how we can encode information. But let's look at DNA. Let's look at the DNA that's in, the information encoded in our DNA. When we take the measurements, we find that the information encoded in DNA is over five billion times more compact than what we can do with a hard drive. Now, we're not so smart, are we? Anybody like mathematics here? there's part of the calculations. That'll get you salivating there too. <laughs> That's just a part of the calculations we did. We actually went out there and did all the mathematics and calculations of this. It came out to be over five billion times more compact. 
Let me put that in picture. If we were to take a two by two inch square chip, just a square chip, two inches by two inches, and put DNA all over that two by two inch chip, how many Bibles could that cover? That would be enough to encode 7.7 .7 million million Bibles on that two by two inch chip. That's how compact the information is in your DNA. That is enough Bibles to go from the earth past the sun when they're stacked up. That's DNA. Now remember, information never arises by random chance processes. And always points back to an intelligent sender. We're getting close to these conclusions. Now, how long would it take using evolution or random chance events to type out such a code? John Joe McFadden, PhD in molecular genetics, wrote a book called Quantum Evolution, describes it. And this man is an evolutionist. And he says, a billion universes, each populated by billions of typing monkeys, could not type out a single gene of this genome. <laughs> so now, we've got this DNA thing here. It's compact with information. And information only comes from an intelligent sender. And this information DNA is greater than anything mankind has ever made. I wonder who encoded that information. I think you see where we're leading now. We're almost to these conclusions. Since all living systems contain DNA, and DNA meets the definition of information, we can now draw seven very strong conclusions. Number one, since the DNA code of all life forms is clearly within the universal definition of information, we can now say, we conclude there must be a sender because all information has to have a sender. Conclusion number one. Conclusion number two. Since the density and complexity of the DNA encoded information is billions of times greater than man's present technology, we conclude the sender must be supremely intelligent. Hmm. He says, what does this mean? means the information encoded in DNA far exceeds all current technologies. Hence, no human being could possibly qualify as the sender who must therefore be sought outside our visible world. Starting to see the power of this argument now. Conclusion number three. Since the sender must have encoded or stored the information into the DNA molecules, constructed the molecular biomachines required for the encoding, decoding, synthesizing processes, and designed all the features for the origin of life forms, we conclude the sender must be purposeful and supremely intelligent. So where did the sender's intelligence and creative power originate? Well, there's only two possibilities. Number one, we can have a regression of senders backwards till we finally get an infant intelligent power. In other words, you can say, who created God? Well, there's a super God. Well, who, who gave that super God all the intelligence? Maybe there's a super, super God who gave the super God the God. Well, who gave the super, super God? And you can go back and back and back, but eventually you're going to get to the original one. Or you can just say there's one eternal sender with infinite intelligence and power. That's called Occam's razor. When you have those two possibilities, take the simplest and the simplest is, there is one all-powerful being. Conclusion number four. Since information is a non-material fundamental entity and cannot originate from material quantities, we conclude the sender must have a non-material component called spirit. God is spirit. Number five. Since information is a non-material fundamental entity and cannot originate from purely material quantities, and since information also originates from man, we must conclude man's nature must have a non-material component. Man has spirit. Number six, since information is a non-material fundamental entity, we can conclude the assertion that the universe arose and evolved solely from mass and energy is now clearly refuted. In other words, the worldview of materialism, folks, has to be false because we can now show that there is a non-material component of this universe. And finally, number seven, 
Since biological information originates only from an intelligent sender, and all theories of chemical and biological evolution require that information must originate solely from mass and energy alone, no sender, we conclude all theories of chemical and bi biological evolution are false. The theory of evolution, folks, is false. It cannot be true unless you don't want to believe in reality. Do you see the power of this argument? Information is a powerful, powerful tool. And that information came from God. So the logical deduction, remember our goals, the information all life and scientific laws governing UDI, universal definition of information have refuted the presupposition of materialism and the theories of chemical and biological evolution and established the existence of an eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful being called God. Those were our two goals. We have met that challenge and we have met those goals. So now, we have taken their challenge, we have accepted it, and we have answered it. So now we can issue our challenge. Anyone who disagrees with these laws and conclusions must falsify them by demonstrating the initial origin of information from purely materialistic sources. We can now issue our challenge. And folks, that challenge has never been met. Folks, our country is under assault. For decades, we've had materialistic teaching, our children, that there is no God, there are no moral absolutes, we're the product of evolution, there is no clear meaning to life. That's why this matters. Folks, you've just seen that this, this state, these statements are all wrong. But yet our children are being assaulted every day. When we turn on the television, we're assaulted with these concepts and philosophies. We now know they're all wrong. We need to reclaim America's heritage. We need to reclaim that we did not evolve from humans, but that God is the creator of all things, and we need not compromise it anywhere. We need to start building from the very first verse in God's word that in the beginning God created and the and way it says it is exactly how he did it. And we need to get back our churches. We need to get back our Christian schools. We need to get back our seminaries. And the way to do that, I believe, is start training these teachers, raise up teachers who are unwilling to compromise God's word to train this next generation so they will grow up and become the next politicians, the next lawyers, and the next teachers, folks. Let's get our churches back to God's word. <laughs> it answers in Genesis, we will not compromise God's word because we believe we find answers in Genesis. Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? We have many people out there trying to tell the gospel, but they don't know why they have a gospel because it starts in the book of Genesis. Does God really exist? We just showed that he does really exist. Why should we trust the Bible? Why is there death and suffering? Every Christian needs to know how to answer that question. Where did Cain get his wife? We need to know how to answer that question because I just saw it on television again off the History Channel and they just degraded God's word in front of millions of people, folks. You need to know how to answer that question. How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? How could Adam name all the animals in one day? What about dinosaurs? Couldn't God have used evolution, folks? We need to know how to answer those questions because the world is asking those questions and if we don't have the answers, they're gonna go to television in Hollywood and get the answers, folks. God commanded us to be apologists. We are commanded to have a ready answer, not sometimes, but always. But do this in gentleness and love, because God loves them too, folks. We know there is a creator God, and that creator died for each and every one of us on the cross. God bless you, and thank you. This has been How DNA Destroys Evolution, presented by Mike Riddle. To receive a free catalog of over 200 awesome Stealing the Mind Bible studies on DVD, CD, or audio tape, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 24 hours a day or on the web at compass.org.